רק בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, Good to be back in Aventura, the Brest of Center, Bezat Hashem, will continue our series, our Musar series, Perkei Avot, to continue developing our character, to continuing working on our Midot, with an ultimate purpose of eliminating all of the barriers that are in front of us and in between us, and Hashem Itbarach, as the Gemara says, and the Rambam also uh, discusses it in more detail in uh, Shmona Prakim, uh, where he says that the, um, what is the difference in prophecy that, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu had versus everyone else? I mean, what's the difference in, in level of prophecy? I mean, it says that Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to Hashem face to face. Now, obviously, Hashem doesn't have a face. So, what's the difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and the prophet Ezekiel? What's the difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and the prophet Jeremiah? What's even the difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and Avraham Avinu? Yitzchak and Yaakov? I mean, these are all righteous angels of human beings. What's the difference? And the Rambam explains it is that just like each person has different character traits, some that are better than others, each one has an obligation to overcome certain things. So you're giving certain, certain things that you excel at. You naturally have a good inclination. For example, someone is born generous, where money is not a test for him. Anytime somebody says, listen, there's a uh, ma'aseh chesed, there's an opportunity for chesed is an opportunity to give tzedakah to this uh, poor family in Jerusalem. There's an opportunity to uh, raise money for CDs to help people do kiru, to help people do tshuva. There's an opportunity for uh, to uh, make a uh, bride and groom happy by getting money so they can have a uh, proper wedding. There's an opportunity to do a mitzvah. This guy, without thinking, just takes out whatever he has in his pocket and he gives. For him. Generosity is not a test. It's not a test. Fam, it's money is just a, a tool. Just like you have a hammer, you don't pray to the hammer. You don't worship the hammer. You don't go to the, before you go to sleep, take the hammer and say, give it a kiss. Good night, little hammer. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for being a hammer. You don't do that, right? It's a hammer. You smash the hammer as hard as you can. After you finish, you put it away. You forget about it. You're not thinking about it. You're not dreaming about the hammer. Unfortunately, with money, it's very different. Sometimes with money, people do worship it. Sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously. Sometimes they know that money is the most valuable thing in their life, which is very sad. And sometimes they don't realize it. How could somebody worship money and not realize it? When they love money too much where everything that they do revolves around money. If there's something to be done, they always ask, what's in it for me? But not what's in it for me, uh, what kind of mitzvah I can get. Not what's in it for me, or who I can help. What's in it for me, where how much profit is there to be made out of this? Is there money in this or no? If there's no money, I'm not really interested. Another end, when you come to a person like this and you say, listen, is a ma'aseh chesed, Bride and groom needs money, this uh, Tamit Chacham needs money to uh, raise money to publish his book, all types, a million and a half different things every day that you uh, need money for every day. And immediately when uh, it comes out, he, you know, he sneaks, sneaks out of the Beknesset from the back. Sneaks out of the Beknesset so you don't see. You know, everybody thinks, wow, what a tzaddik, he's stepping backwards from the Sefer Torah. Not realizing he's not in the Torah, he just knows the guy who just came in is looking for money, so he's sneaking from the back. Or sometimes, you know, he feels shame. He sees everybody else taking money out. You know, when you have like a bunch of people in a Beknesset, people are taking money out for something that's uh, worthy, whether it's Sefer Torah or whatever, something that uh, everyone agrees is a necessary thing. So he now he feels embarrassed not taking money because he sees everybody else gave, and now they're all looking at him. So what is he going to do, miskin? 
So whatever, so he reaches out of the pocket and he grabs, he's hoping that the first bill that comes out is a dollar. But what happens when the dollar comes out, you see a dollar has uh, dust on it. And the uh, George Washington is like, wow, finally I can breathe. The guy is so cheap, he's scared that it was hard. It's hard for him to take the dollar out of the pocket. It's actually a true story one time of a guy that was known to be very, very cheap. And they, uh, you know, they were trying to raise money. The kids were trying to raise money in the neighborhood. And uh, everybody was contributing. It's little kids. You know, you give them whatever. They're, they're raising money for TTO. They're raising money for Sidurim. They're raising money for something worthy. And you know, you don't want to give them some koach to, to continue. But this guy, Mamas, couldn't do it. So they were selling cookies. The little kids were selling cookies. Everybody said, well, it's one dollar for a cookie. It's one dollar. Everybody bought a cookie. Some people bought more. Like, no, Tvika, get a, get a couple of cookies. No, 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 I'm, I'm good, I'm good. I'm, 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 I ate before I came here. You know those people? I ate before I came here. I ate before I came here. Just, so, just no money coming out. The guy hasn't eaten in a week because he's scared. But yeah, I ate before I came here. He doesn't want to spend a dollar. Okay, whatever. Forget about it. It's not for the food, bay mate. The, food, the, the cookie is just for, you know, to make it nice. But... Donate the money, but you're not gonna donate the money for no reason. So buy one cookie. No, one cookie. Guy is trying to like get out of it, but everybody's looking and he feels uncomfortable. So, okay, okay, I'll buy one cookie. He takes out the dusty dollar bill. <laughs> the dusty dollar bill, he gives it to the kid, his hands are shaking. He's about to have a heart attack, he gets the cookie, he's like, Oh enjoy, enjoy peanut butter and jelly, your favorite. Peanut butter or cookie, whatever. Your favorite. Enjoy, Mabruk, Mazalto. You got the cookie. The guy, what are you gonna do? He bought the cookie, so he starts, he takes a bite. And all of a sudden, you see his face turn blue. And he starts choking on the cookie. He must start choking on the cookie. It's a true story. And they're trying to hit him on the back, hit him on the front, hit him on the side, get the cookie out. It's not coming out. It's not coming out. The guy Omash can't breathe. He collapses on the floor. And they can't they don't know what to do. Immediately his friend from across the room, who knows him for many, many years, runs over there, takes a dollar out of his pocket and puts it on his hand. Immediately you see psh, the cookie flies out of his mouth, out of his throat, and he can start breathing again. He yes, goes to this guy and says, like, Wow, we have prophecy? He's like, Moshe Rabbeinu? How'd you know? Put a dollar in his hand. Why, why'd you know? He says, I know this guy my whole life. His body couldn't tolerate, couldn't tolerate what his soul just did. His soul just gave a dollar. The body is so cheap it couldn't tolerate it. It constricted the fact that he just gave a dollar, he couldn't handle it. Mamash, his body was going against it. This is the Maasesh it's a real story. Why does this guy like money so much? Why is he, why is he so connected to it? Because he, Mamash, he thinks that the world is running out of it and there's limited opportunities out there. And this is actually one of the major tools if you know this, then I'm going to tell you right now that it can either make you or break you as a professional, as an entrepreneur, as in general, and if anyone that has a big project that they want to achieve in their life, a big part obviously, aside from the Siyat Bishmai that you need and Hashem deciding that you, whether you're going to succeed or not, is your mentality. In my business years, one of the major reasons of uh, why I saw many, many businesses that came through my door, either they tried to have us raise money from them or they wanted to invest in us or so on. A lot of the business people would come to me and ask me for advice, analyze their business, sell their business and so on. So I saw a lot of businesses. And some of them I would see, it's an interesting idea, it may succeed. Some of them I would say it's a bad idea, it would fail. But most of the time, 
whether a business succeeded or not had nothing to do with the business. It had to do with who's running it. And their mentality. If they had a small-minded mentality, they're bound to fail. Bound to fail. It's only a matter of time before it fails. If they have a small-minded mentality where if they think that the world is limited, there's limited opportunities, there's limited amount of money to be made, there's a limited amount of customers to attain. You know, a type of person where as soon as he sees somebody opening a store right next to him, across the street from him, or even in the same town as him, he starts doing Kaddish on the guy, hoping he dies. He hates the guy so much that he opened next door because he thinks, what? He's stealing his panasa. He thinks that the guy that opened next door, same business, he has an electronic store, he has an electronic store. He has jewelry store, he has jewelry store. He has moving company, he has a moving company. I think just because we both work in Florida, or we both work in New York, or both work in the same city, or even in the same block, he thinks, this guy is stealing my panasa. And he much hates him. He doesn't even know the guy, but he already hates him. In his heart, he hates him, which is, by the way, is a sin. Not allowed to hate anybody in your heart. But why does he hate him? Because he has a small-minded mentality. He believes in a limited God, Hashem Yilachem. And even more so, even if you says, no, no, I believe Hashem can do anything. It's just business. It's the separate. It's Ishtadlut. It's up to me, business. You know, everyone thinks that, you know, Hashem created the world, but he spent all of his money on creation. He ran out of money, so now he's saving up for the Mashiach. He say he spent all of his money on creation. Maybe on uh, Matan Torah, he had a big party, but after that, he's been saving all this time for the Mashiach. He can't give us any money. So, some people think that the guy opened up the store next to him, he's stealing his parnasa. Or if the guy came there and he bought something from him, he's not going to buy something from him. You know, small-minded mentality. And this destroys businesses every single day. This destroys partnerships. This destroys success stories. People, mamash, fail in their endeavors, mainly because of their mentality. If they had a big mentality, they'd pay attention to the goal. Instead of the journey, instead of how to get there, instead of if, it's, if I'm going to make the money from this customer or that customer or 10 customers later, it doesn't make a difference. The reality of it is that most of the real money that you make to pay the bills you make from the small customers, the money that takes you to the next level is the big customers. But the big customers come once in a while. To survive, you need the small customers. So when you have a, a, a limited mentality, Every time these small customers come, you don't really care about them so much. You're waiting for the big customer. But the big customer, if he leaves or he goes to buy somewhere else, it ruins your entire month. So it's one of the ways, one of many, many ways where people destroy their businesses. And little by little, these ideas fail because as soon as they hit some type of hardship, they commit suicide. The business goes bankrupt. They make certain mistakes that are unreasonable. And sometimes, before I answer your question, sometimes you'll actually see small-minded people succeed in business. You'll see them have some idea. You'll see them have an idea. It succeeds. Start a website of some service. And it's, it, it takes off. It goes from nothing to something. All of a sudden, they're making a million dollars a year, which according to most people's standards, it's success. In reality, they're failing miserably even more than the guy that never started. Because if it wasn't for their awful mentality, it would be a billion dollar business. How do you know? You know as soon as you see a competitor come into the market. All of a sudden you see a competitor with a similar product, just different logo. Competitor, similar product, different board of directors. He has a new email system. He has a little nicer screw. Nothing's a big deal. But all of a sudden you see this guy come into the market that this guy's already been in for 10, 15 years. He's in, he's dominating the market 15 years. All of a sudden you see this cowboy come in, take over the entire market, take this big guy to school. All of a sudden he goes to, you know, he takes back his uh, binky. Becomes a little baby again next to the big guy. What happened? What happened?
happened? How'd you let this guy beat you? You had the money. You had everything. This actually happened many, many times. One example I could tell you that I saw throughout my career is uh, that famous event. I think I mentioned in one of the lectures in the past is that uh, after the dot-com crisis in 2000, all the dot-com companies, the technology companies, had major issues. Most of them collapsed and went bankrupt. They had fictional valuations to begin with. But anyway, there was a few survivors. eBay was one of the survivors. Microsoft was one of the survivors. Yahoo, America Online. But nobody really wanted to invest in anything new. Everyone was too scared of their own shadow. Everyone was said, if I survived, I'm good enough. If I survive the war, that means that whatever I'm doing is fine. I don't need to change. Which is also a, a form of small mentality. Being content. Thinking that you're good enough. And we'll connect this to the Torah in a moment. Thinking that you're good enough is one of the biggest reasons of why people fail in life. Thinking that I don't need to pray hard. Hashem's listening to me whether I pray hard or not. I don't need to learn extra Torah. Hashem is happy with whatever I learn in this awful generation. I learn 15 minutes, Hashem's happy, like I'm doing him a favor. I keep half the Shabbat, Hashem's happy with half the Shabbat. I heard some rabbi say, just do whatever you can. I heard actually on the way here, you know, I don't know why I get punished sometimes, and I, I press play to and some of these, you know, people send me these different uh, clips. And I saw this clip and some guy that I, he calls himself a rabbi. He's actually relatively popular. Uh, but he's a kofer gamu. Uh, I just don't have the energy for another public war, so I'm not mentioning his name. But anyway, he says in his lecture, anyone that tells you that you should be scared, anyone that tells you that you're a sinner, anyone that tells you that you're supposed to do more than what you are right now, that's not the way to teach. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is that you should have your own unique, custom-made relationship with God. Now this is coming from a rabbi, not a Christian. This is Christian. That's what, that's what Christianity does. Custom-made, whatever. They made their own religion. Why not make your own uh, belief system also and worship system? When it comes from a rabbi, this is actually 100% kfilah. This is against the Torah to say this. But people don't know anything. So they listen. Oh, wow, what a tzaddik. It's a chidush. It's a chidush. He says, nah, even if what you're doing is, I can read you what it says in the Chumash, he says. But it's going to be too much for you to handle. I can read you what Hashem says. I can read you what Hashem says in the Chumash. Five books of Moses. I can read you, he says. But it's going to be too much for you. He decided already for them. He's a prophet, apparently. He decided for people... They can't handle it. They can't handle what Hashem said. Even a five-year-old child can handle it. They can't handle it. So he decided they can't handle it. So you should just have your own unique relationship with God. So, okay, so what if I say my own unique relationship with God is not listening to God? Not listening to anything he says. That's very unique. It's so unique, I'm publicizing and everybody's listening to me now. What kind of shtiot is this? It was nonsense. This is what happens. This is what happens in today's world where people, mamash, they can't bring themselves to the realization that there's an instruction set. It's black and white. It's not gray. It's not orange. It's just black and white. Either you do it or you don't. And we're going to learn from today here. In the Mishnah that we have we're finishing the chapter 2 of, um, of uh, Masechet Avot. But ultimately, to uh, finish the story of these companies where they also thought the same thing like this Koferav, you can have your own relationship with your customers and eventually everything's going to be fine. So when a tiny little company came to them that also survived the dot-com crisis, it's tiny, it was small, he said, listen, we have a technology and we'd like to sell it because we're not really sure if we'll be able to survive on our own. So we'd like to sell it just to cash out. A couple of Russian guys invented it. He said, listen, interesting technology. We think it could be big. 
but we don't have really the money to get it to where it needs to be. We rather sell it to you for ten million dollars, which in the technology world is like me telling you give a dollar for a CD. It's nothing. Microsoft ten million dollars. They spend it on the way to work. Yahoo ten million dollars. They lost it on the way to work. America Online. They just did a merger for eighty-five billion dollars right before that with Time Warner. Ten million dollars. It's a rounding error. It's nothing. Stiot. So this little tiny company came to all three of those companies. They came to Microsoft. They came to America Online. And they came to Yahoo. But all three of these companies were in the technology world. They were considered kofrim. <laughs> they didn't want to change. They were happy where they were. Like, no, 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 we're happy. We don't want this new technology. We're happy. We're fine. We, if we survive the dot-com crisis, we're fine. If Hashem didn't punish me already for Chilul Shabbat, that means he's okay with it. If he didn't, it says in the Torah, Mot Yumat, right? It says somebody is a, drives on Shabbat. Says Mot Yumat. Somebody smokes a sugar on Shabbat. Mot Yumat. Somebody sows on Shabbat. Says Mot Yumat. If Hashem didn't kill me by now, maybe he's okay already with it. He says, hey, listen, he does other mitzvot. We rationalize our craziness and our sins. We rationalize them. So that's what these three big companies did. They rationalized if we survived the dot-com crisis, we're okay. Whereas you would have it over the next 10 years, those three companies hit a big wall. America Online almost went bankrupt. It had to break itself up from Time Warner because the merger was a disaster. It almost became completely worthless. It was saved by the bell. Mamash, last minute it was saved. Yahoo also almost went bankrupt after the uh, crisis of 2008. Their uh, standard technology became obsolete. And Microsoft, even though they continued being in business, they, no longer, they were no longer the leader. Who became the leader? The one company that replaced all three of their technologies. That little tiny company. Today it's called Google. The little tiny company that wanted to sell itself for $10 million. No one wanted to buy it. What was the technology? Search engine. Find stuff on the internet. Yahoo was happy with the way they were doing things. AOL was happy with the eh, uh, thing that you had when you were dialing up to the internet. You had a little choking cow to go into the internet. And then you have Microsoft was happy selling the software that was obsolete already 20 years ago, but we're still using it today like idiots, because we still want to buy, even though we can get it for free from Google and from many other companies. Well, we're addicted to it, but nonetheless, Google replaced all of them. Why? Because Google had a big world mentality. They had some Emunai issues, they almost sold out, but they made it. They had a big world mentality, they started with that one idea, they kept continued developing it, and these couple of Jewish guys built this company. I don't know about their level of observance, I don't think it's very high, but nonetheless, still Jewish guys that uh, built this company to be bigger than all three of those companies combined. Now they do a lot more than search engine, they even have a car that drives by itself, and all types of interesting technology. You had a question? Answered already, or you just forgot, or it's not relevant? Answered? Okay, well, it's the afternoon smile. So, one of the most important things that we see every week in Parashat Shavua is a little bit of a secret in every parasha that's relevant to us individually. About a year or a year and a half ago, I did a, or two years ago, I, uh, not a year and a half, either a year or two years ago, the Parashat Shavua, Parashat Vaikra, we're starting a new book, the book of Leviticus. I mentioned one of the Chidushim that I heard from Rav Nisim Yagin. The parasha starts, Vayikrayin Moshe Vayidabar Adonai Elav Me'oel Mo'ed Le'emor, Dabar Ebnei Yisrael V'amarta Lahem, Adam Ki Ekriv Mikem Korban. So he called to Moses, and Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man among you bring an offering to Hashem. And it continues. In so many words, the first couple of verses of the, of the parasha, Talk about how Hashem is requesting for Moshe Rabbeinu 
to tell the people that now that you've built the tabernacle, you built the Bet Mikdash of the desert, you've worked very hard on it. Moshe Rabbeinu went through major Mesirut Nefesh to build this Bet Mikdash. To get the money, he wanted to make sure there's right accounting. When something was lost, they blamed him for it. So he started crying to Hashem, so they find it. Because you know, if he took it out of his pocket to give, they'd still blame him. So he started crying to Hashem, Hashem, please, let them find it. Show them, I didn't steal the money. Then they thought that he's stealing the tzedakah on the side anyway. Then there was problems with this, problems with, problems with everything. They blamed it on Moshe Rabbeinu. Finally, he builds the Bet HaMikdash of the desert. And he waits outside. Why is he waiting outside? Go inside. Go to Kodesh Kodeshim. Talk to Hashem. You built the place. You're the leader. Go inside. We don't even build a house. We go to our friend's house. We don't even knock. We go inside because we feel comfortable. You know those people? They just come into your house. They feel at home. Or they come into your house. They already put their feel. First time they come to your house, they put their feet on your table. I had one of these kids, young kids, millennial uh, generation, come to me for a job interview. Young guy, handsome looking guy, nice suit, all sparkly. He comes to my office, he's got this resume that has a lot of words on it. And I'm asking him some questions. The next thing I know, this guy sits back, gets comfortable on the chair, and he puts his feet on my desk. On my desk he puts. He felt so at home if we put his feet on my desk. Funny thing is, I don't even do stuff like that at home. I wonder if he does it at home. He didn't get the job, by the way. So, we do anything. We give staka. We feel like we can call the, the rabbi 500 times a day. I got a guy who says he promises to give staka. He promises. He hasn't given staka yet. But he promises to give staka, but he wants to talk to me every day. He's not given, he hasn't given it tzedakah yet. And it's not even like he's promising, listen, I'm going to fund your chesed fund that you have, $740,000. You know, we try to give out 25,000 CDs a month. We're giving a couple of hundred uh, uh, Kiru packages a month. All the stuff costs money. It's not free. It actually costs money. So we're trying to raise $740,000. Maybe I'll actually one day make a salary. You know, a few years of working for free. You figure maybe one day I'll get a salary. But no big deal. Hashem pays anyway. So we figure we're going to raise some money. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe this guy is going to fund the 740000 He wants to talk to me so often. He hasn't given $10 yet. $10 he hasn't given. And he's not even promising to give uh, uh, big money. Maybe he's going to give $100 if he gives. But he wants to talk to me every day. Text messages every day. That come as... Uh, he feels comfortable. We feel comfortable. We're very, you know... Like I don't have anybody else that, that calls me and texts me and has problems also. He's the only one left in the world and I'm left in the world. Moshe Rabbeinu is him and I'm, you know, Yoshua Benun. Waiting to learn. I don't know, what's going on here? We feel very comfortable with ourselves. But Moshe Rabbeinu himself, Moshe Rabbeinu never felt comfortable. Even though he speaks to Hashem face to face, he doesn't feel comfortable. Even though he built the Bet HaMikdash of the desert, he built it. Doesn't feel comfortable. He doesn't feel comfortable. I'm not talking about he doesn't feel comfortable to do anything special. I'm talking about go inside. Go inside. Just go. Look, look around. Look what you built. Zaku Baruch. It's Kodesh Kodeshim. Aron Kodesh. This is where they're going to build the Korbanot. No. Parashat Shavua says, Vaikra El Moshe. Hashem called him, come, come. Now you come inside. He had to call him to come inside. Why? He says, why am I going to feel comfortable? It's not my house, it's Hashem's house. It's not proper manners to just go inside. And then he says, Rab Nisim again, Zechat Adik Livacha, says, all of the mitzvot that Hashem has in the Torah, he doesn't say, Adam, keep Shabbat. A man should keep Shabbat. A man should do Brit Milah. A man should make sure his wife goes to the mikveh. He doesn't say that. He said Adam. But here in the issue of Korban, here when Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, tell the nation 
that when a man among you brings an offering, brings a korban to Hashem, and he gives him the steps of what he has to do. Why is he mention? Why is he adding this word Adam? Why is it a cow's going to give the korban? He's going to give bring his friend because they listen. I got a really cool place for you to go. Where's it go? Oh, it's a mishkan over there. Two of us go in, only one comes out. Who else is going to do it? A man obviously has to do it. So why does Hashem add this word? Rav Nisimi again says, Hashem tells you, before you bring the korban, before you bring the sacrifice, because the sacrifice, in essence what it says, you made a sin. If it's a sin offering, you made a sin. Instead of Hashem punishing you with death penalty, He's killing the animal. In reality, it's supposed to be you, not the animal. Miskina, the animal didn't do anything. What the cow do? The cow did Chilul Shabbat. The cow didn't smoke on Shabbat. You smoked on Shabbat because you forgot it's Shabbat. If you knew it's Shabbat, you still smoked, there's no Kurban. It's death penalty. But if you forgot it's Shabbat, or you forgot something, you made a Shogik sin, so a sin by that's accidental, then you bring a Kurban. But he says, before you bring the Kurban, because we don't have Kurbanot anymore. So today, as Hashem said to the Prophet, now since we don't have the Bet Mikdash, your prayers replace the Korbanot. Every time you pray, Shachrit, Mincha, Arvit, Musaf, every single time that's instead of a sacrifice. It's just like you went to the Bet Mikdash and you brought a big cow. She says, before you bring me this $15,000 cow, because maybe you have money. I give you money, so you're gonna, it's not a big deal for you to spend $15,000 on a cow. You're going to be a uh, gvir, you're going to bring 10 cows. Before you bring the cow, first of all, be a decent human being. Work on your midot. First of all, work on your character traits. Then come talk to me. Don't come talk to me with your gava and shamaim, because I'm not going to listen. You have gava, I'm running away. Hashem says in the Gemara, a place that's gava, I can't be there. A, a person that has gava, him and me can't be in the same room. Pride. Because his pride makes him think that he's a mini god. Can't be two gods. Let him be God by himself. He's his own idol worship. So first of all, before you bring me your prayer, before you ask me for stuff, before you say I'm sorry, before you say thank you, before you say anything, first of all, be a decent human being. Work on your character traits. Where are you going to learn this from? You learn it from Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu built the place. And his neshama was so tweaked and amazing and developing his character traits that he knew enough that if he would have just walked in into the Mishkan that he built, a dead cow in the middle of the street would be considered better than him. Why? Because it's bad manners. It's not your house. Not before you come in. This we learn from Moshe Rabbeinu. And this also answers the question of why did Moshe Rabbeinu have such greater prophecy than everyone else? The Rambam answers, he says that every time you overcome a character trait, flaw that you have, you immediately destroy one of the walls that separates you from God. You have Gava, you have the Great Wall separating you. Bigger wall than Donald Trump wants to build for the Mexicans. Gava. If it wasn't, uh, if I was, uh, would be allowed to say it, I'd tell you that you're wasting your time even trying to talk to Hashem. We have Gava. You think you're a big deal? You think the Panasa is coming from your effort, Bermit? You're a borderline atheist. Unfortunately, most people have a certain level of gava, myself included. So we all have to work on it. But the key here is to understand is that this gava 
this pride that you have, thinking that you're a big deal, this stinginess that you have, thinking that Hashem ran out of money and if you give this last few dollars for tzedakah, you're gonna not be able to sleep at night. This flawed character trait that you have is what is separating you from God. So Rabbi Tarfon takes over the last couple of Mishnayot of chapter 2 of Pirkei Avot. In the 20th Mishnah, it says the following. Rabbi Tarfon Omer, היום קצר והמלאכה מרובה והפועלים עצלים והשכר הרבה ובעל הבית דוחק. רבי טרפון, who some say was one of the rabbis for רבי עקיבא, some say he was his colleague, and some say he was originally his rabbi, but רבי עקיבא got to his level. Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin. So Rabbi Tarfon was not only Kodesh Kodeshim, giant sage, giant Chacham, encyclopedic knowledge, but he was also a multi-millionaire. Now usually, somebody has money, people think he's automatically smart. Oh, he's such a smart guy. Who? The guy's driving a Ferrari. You know him? No, but he must be smart. He has a Ferrari. <laughs> but the funny thing is, coming from, you know, having a little bit of experience, I can tell you that many people that are rich, many, not all, but many of them are not geniuses. They're not geniuses. Some of them are actually outright stupid. But they have one thing that all of us need a lot more of. Mazal. We need mazal. Somebody came to somebody that was very rich and they asked them, what's the secret to your success? Most people that are rich are not going to tell you the truth. My father always used to tell me, he go to somebody, he ask him, oh, how'd you make all your money? He says, listen, I could tell you I have $10 million. I could tell you how I made $9 million. Because why can't you tell me the whole ten? He goes, the first million I can't tell you. After that, I can tell you how I made the, ne- the next nine. After the first million, I can tell you. So, one time they asked a guy who's rich, told him, listen, what's the secret to your success? Because honestly, 99% luck. He goes, what's the other 1%? One percent, I had a little bit of uh, good ideas. So, wow, imagine that. It's amazing. What would you change? So that would change that the one percent should also be luck. Then I'd have even more money. There was also a time, it was a Gabai, or a Beknesset. In the old days, there was many illiterate people. And... Um, this Beknesset wanted to develop, wanted to become more modernized. He said, listen, we're going to try to raise money, we're going to try to have every everything in order, we're going to write things down. So when the holidays come, you have to write down every time somebody donates money, put their name, put the number next to it, because we want to make sure we don't lose any money. Sorry, I can't write. Because what do you mean you can't write? You're a grown man. How do you can't write? I can't write, I'm sorry, I can't write. You have to learn. He goes, I'm not, listen, I'm already too old to learn. I'm already too old to learn. This is, this is what I do. I'm working in Beknesset since I was 15. I'm 35. I can't do anything. I was like, listen, we have to fire you then. You have to fire me. You have to fire me. What am I going to do? That's what Hashem wants. That's what Hashem wants. You know, in those days, they were simple. Tamim tiyem Hashem. Be simple with Hashem. So they fired him. They replaced him with a 18 year old literate kid and this guy we had to get a job so what do you do what can I possibly do so he went to the local place the market he saw there was some tools toolbox being sold 
So go, I'll buy these tools and I'll sell them individual, I'll make some money. So he bought the tools, bought the toolbox, he started selling the tools individually. Made some profit, he did it again. Went to the market, bought a toolbox, sold them individually. Little by little, he's rolling the money. Has a lot of siyat dishmaya, lo and behold, within the next couple of years, he becomes a multi-millionaire. Builds a company. Now, he used to get big deliveries. He's not uh, buying it from the market. So this big company from China comes to him and says, okay, listen, you're a $10 million order. Sign over here so we could ship you the goods. And he uh, says to them, I'm sorry, I don't know how to write. He goes, what do you mean you don't know how to write? How did you become so rich? He goes, I became rich. I work hard. Hashem blessed me. He says, yeah, but imagine if you made so much money without knowing how to write, being illiterate, imagine what would happen if you knew how to write. He says, if I knew how to write, I'd still be a gabai. So Rabbi Tafon, who was a multi-millionaire and a big chacham, is telling us something special. He says the day is short, the task is abundant, the laborers are lazy, the reward is great, and the master of the house is insistent. In so many words, Rabbi Tafon is giving us like an analogy of our task at hand in our 70, 80, 100, 120 years on this planet. He says if we treat every day like it's short, we're going to manage the day properly. But if we just go on and on and on and take our time, and you wake up in the morning, and you finish the entire cup of coffee and then you have the meal come and then maybe around 10 30 11 you do tefillin then maybe you're gonna get in the car take the easy road drive below the speed limit to get to work and when you get to work you're gonna type with one finger at a time just to make sure you don't make any mistakes and tell everybody you're gonna call them back because, you know, you, you already handled one call. It's enough. You're not going to survive in life. You're not going to achieve much. But if you act like your time is limited, you're going to value your time much more. And more importantly, you're going to achieve much more. The task is abundant talking about our mitzvot. If you don't mind, it's really distracting. If you don't mind stopping or doing that in the kitchen, it's very, very distracting to everybody. See, everybody's looking at you or me with the wrapping. I'm sorry, just... Uh... One time, they were giving a lecture. Sages in the Gemara. And uh, I believe it was Rebbe, Rabbi Udana Si. Smelled that one of the students didn't smell so good, it smelled like garlic. He said, Whoever smelled, whoever ate garlic before my shiul, stand up and leave the room. You're not allowed to make everyone suffer because you have bad habits. Not allowed. You like garlic, congratulations, but that means that everybody has to smell you now. You have a room, 500 people, they have to smell you. It's not nice. Why do they have to smell you? So, one person got up, but then the whole room got up. And everybody left. Everyone had good midot, where no one wanted to, anyone to be embarrassed, everyone left. From here we learn that even to go to Shio Torah, even to be surrounded by other people, we can't just think about ourselves, okay, I'm here, I'm going to learn Shio Torah, I'm going to go learn some Gemara, and I, I, that means I can do whatever I want. Shekinah is coming. No, no, no. You have to also be responsible 
and see what everybody around you. It's not about that Rebbe wanted to embarrass this guy, Chas Shalom. Rebbe, Rebbe Yudah Nasi, it's Kodesh Kodeshim. But he knew that if he doesn't say anything, no one's going to be able to learn. Might as well not have a shoe. Same concept. I see one, two, three, seven, eight, fifteen faces all looking, looking, looking. You forgot about what I'm saying. You forgot that I was even here, Bechlal. With the rapper. And I looking at the rapper, I saw it's going to take another 25 minutes. Uh, you have to say something. It's not a, it's so, just so you know, this is not a something that's different than what the sages would have done. I'll buy that I get to their shoes, but you see my point. You learn from them. So, Rabbi Talfon is telling us the day is short, the task is abundant, the laborers are lazy, the reward is great, and the master of the house is insistent. First and foremost, he's giving us an analogy on life and he's telling us something critical. He's telling us that if we start treating our life like life, like what it's supposed to be, we'll achieve something. But if we start treating life like it's just a thing to do, you wake up, you eat, you drink, you drive, you work a little, you eat, you drink, you go home, go to sleep, you wake up, you eat, you drink, go to work, somebody pays you, somebody yells at you, somebody complains about you, drive home, you stay in traffic for three hours, get home, your wife or your husband complains about you, your kids are yelling, they don't want to let you go to sleep, you go to sleep finally, and you wake up again the next day, and you eat, and you drink, and pretty much your whole life is based on eating, drinking, and just going through the motion. If you treat life like that, you're in a very, very dangerous situation. Such a dangerous situation that you could very well be wasting your entire life without even knowing it. And unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of people in the world, the Jews included, are very much living this life. They wake up, they eat, they drink, they go chase money so they can get stuff because they believe that the stuff will make them happy. Once they attain the stuff, they realize it's not going to make them happy. So they convince themselves that if they replace it with better stuff, that will make them happy. So now they go back to work and eat and drink and sleep to get more money so they get new stuff, a bigger house, a bigger, bigger house, maybe a second house, a nicer car, a car without a scratch, two cars, a motorcycle, a boat, a bigger stake, and little by little we try to suffocate ourselves with stuff, with material, because we feel that maybe, just maybe, the next one is going to make me happy. Maybe that's what I'm missing. My whole life, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, I've been trying to get happiness. I got married, didn't make me so happy for more than the first few months. I got the kids, they're driving me crazy. I got my degree, who cares after graduation? I just need a job. I got the job, it's not what it's all cracked up to be. I always wanted to be a lawyer, now that I'm a lawyer, I'm a, I became a slave. I have paperwork from here to the ceiling and I'm paying my dues for the first five or ten years until they even acknowledge me like a human being. Finally, I'm a human being, but in reality, I'm just processing money. The client calls me to see how I'm doing, I charge him a thousand dollars for it. Why? Because that's what lawyers do. Little by little, I'm achieving these so-called materialistic goals and I get moments of happiness moments of happiness you get the car that you've always wanted even if it's a little Buick if it's the car you've always wanted you have a little bit of happiness in the beginning it could be even for a couple of months but eventually you get bored it's the same car eventually you're looking at the world from the inside, you're not looking at it from the outside. 
So it doesn't matter whether you're inside a Buick, or you're inside a Ferrari, or you're inside a boat, or you're inside a plane, you're still looking through a windshield. And there's still a million and a half cars around you with snow on them, or mud, or everything is the same. Why? Because you have some lights on your dashboard. You don't care about those lights after two months. Because you can see a picture on the dashboard of what the other car looks like behind you. You don't care about that after two months. Because there's some robot telling you where to go and you paid $5,000 for it. You could have got it for free on an app on your phone. Now you're regretting the fact that you have to pay 50 bucks more a month for this stupid thing. But you have a little dashboard. All these things don't matter anymore. So the car, and the next car, and the next car, and the next car, and little by little, the more cars you get, the more bored you get. The quicker you get bored of them. So you start replacing them with other stuff. You get watches, people start collecting watches. Especially on Wall Street, I see all these guys collecting watches. They love watches, like every one of them became a connoisseur of watches. No one knows how to tell the time, but they have a fancy $30,000 watch. But after a while, what do these watches do? They're in your closet. When you get so scared, you leave them in a safe. So the safe enjoys all the watches. I even knew one time, this one employee of mine, his wife, he bought his wife a very expensive engagement ring. But she was so scared that the diamond would fall off the engagement ring that she bought a fake diamond on a replica ring and she'd always wear the fake ring. The real one was in the safe. This is how demented people are. This is real. This is, I bet you anyone that's watching this, that knows a few people with money, knows this story happens in every town, at least in America. They buy these expensive rings, the ring goes in a safe, the fake one goes on the hand. So the safe is enjoying all this wonderful jewelry. But people, yo, everything that you see is fake. Everything that you see is fake. Because we're all trying to empty this hole, it's a big hole, it just keeps getting bigger. Something is missing. And the material just can't fix it. When you live life chasing food and drinking and eating and just going through life day after day after day after day, you are at a very, very big risk to completely waste your life without even knowing it. And one day, you arrive at 70, 80, 90 years old and you realize you've wasted your life and you absolutely have no purpose whatsoever. Now, if you actually want a purpose, first thing you have to acknowledge is that the purpose is bigger than you. The purpose is not just you. It must be beyond you, bigger than you. Once you know this purpose, everything changes. Once you connect to the purpose, everything changes. When you realize that Hashem Barach gave you a task at hand, You're not worried about getting to the goal anymore. You're worried about trying. Because as Rabbi Talfon is telling you here, you have a limited amount of time, you have a lot of work. A lot of work. What is he saying here? You're not going to achieve it. You're not going to get to the ultimate goal. You're not going to fulfill everything. You're not going to learn the entire Torah. One of the reasons you're not going to learn the entire Torah is because really, deep down inside, the laborers are lazy. You're lazy. Not lazy that you're staying home and sleeping all day, which unfortunately can be the case also. But because you're treating it like it's work. You're treating the mitzvot like it's, ah, oh, i got to pray again. Ah. Oh. Tefillin today, isn't it Chag or something? I can skip Tefillin today. You know, people get excited when it's Chag. You don't have to do Tefillin. The whole five minutes that it takes. Oh, we don't have to do Tachnun today, right? Somebody did a Brit, Brit Milah, Brit Milah. Somebody did Brit Milah. Everybody gets excited. Nobody has, somebody did Brit Milah. Or there's some other, you know, valid reason to not do Tachnun. 
Everybody gets excited. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Brit Mila. No, no, wedding. Oh, no, there's a groom. There's a groom. You got married. Well, last week, that's okay. It's okay. We. You're married. You're married. Still serve the Everybody gets excited. We're missing a small part of the prayer. Why? Because well, we're treating it like it's work. What are we not doing? We're not acknowledging the next part of the Mishnah that Rabbi Tafon is telling us. The reward is great. Every one of these mitzvot is a priceless 100 carat D flawless diamond for the smallest mitzvah you can possibly imagine. The tiniest mitzvah. Now Rabbi Udanasi already told us don't Evaluate what mitzvah is big, what mitzvah is small, but we still do anyway. We also know that there's significance in, serious, in, in certain mitzvot based on punishment. We know that if somebody forgets to do netilat yadayim, it's not good, but he's not going to gain on for it. Somebody drives on Shabbat, it's a different story. He may not leave gain on if he doesn't do tshuva. Somebody cheats on his taxes, it's not good. Somebody cheats his fellow Jew, he may not wake up in Tchiat HaMetim. It's levels. So we know. But Rabbi Tafun is telling you, the reward is so great that all the good for all of creation that ever existed from the beginning of the world until the end of the world is not even enough to show you what the reward is of one hour in Olam Abba. One hour. One moment. Meaning that this little netilat yadayim, this modea ani lefanecha, you do in the morning, you're not even mentioning God's name, you're just thanking Him. Without mentioning His name. Thank you Hashem for bringing me back my neshama. That's it. Just saying that. Just do netilat yadayim. Just Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael in the morning. What does it take? Five minutes? With Kavanah. Ten? Tefillin. Do you do Tefillin? Another five minutes. He says, all of the good that ever existed in this world for all of the people. The seven and a half billion people right now, 7.4 billion people approximately. Last generation, there was also about 7.4 billion people. Last generation, there was about seven. Last generation before that was about 6.6 .6, and so on and so forth. It was, you know, did it just become 7 billion now and there was like 3 yesterday. There's always a lot. So let's just estimate there was, I don't know, 100 billion people. Probably more, but let's say there was 100 billion people throughout history. Or 50 billion, or whatever number you want. Pick it. It's a lot. You, lucky you, happen to be part of the 20 million chosen ones and out of the 20 million chosen ones you're one of the maybe 3 million that were chosen but actually listen it's 20 million chosen but only 3 million listen 3 million keep Shabbat 3 million late feeling 3 million not everybody does Three million, you're one of them. And your reward for doing tefillin, for wearing tzitzit, for wearing a kippah, for saying Baruch Hashem, for saying Amen, Amen, after a bracha, is more valuable than all of the good that all of the generations have ever had from the beginning of the world to the end of the world in this world. Changes the perspective of things. That's what Rabbi Tafon is telling you. He says, you're lazy. Not because you have such a long life, because the day is short. Life is really short. You don't even know how long you're going to be here. Everyone thinks they're going to live forever. But in reality, we all know that no one lives forever. Some of us even know young people that died. Like my cousin that I told you guys a couple of times about, that died on Rosh Hashanah. Unfortunately, second day of Rosh Hashanah, 23-year-old kid, he didn't think he was going to die. He woke up, happy-go-lucky, went on a scooter, 
fell, hurt his head, went to, this, to the uh, hospital. Hospital said everything's fine. Go back home. Went back home, went to sleep and never woke up. Shemelchem. Destroyed his family, destroyed everyone around him. Zot Hashem hopefully help everybody do tshuva. But the point being here, did you think that anyone in his life, anyone that knew him, not just his parents obviously and his brothers or sisters, but anyone that even knew him from school, from the neighborhood, from the store, from work, from something, anyone thought, hey, this 23-year-old kid's gonna, I'd say he's only got a day, to le- a day left. Everyone thinks they're gonna live forever. Rabbi Tafur is telling you, no, my friend, the day is short. Life is short. You never know how long you have. The amount of mitzvot and Torah you need to learn is huge. The work is abundant. The task is abundant. It's an enormous amount you have to do. Because if you actually realize how many opportunities you have to collect diamonds, mitzvah here, mitzvah there, mitzvah there, chesed here, chesed there, you have so many opportunities to collect mitzvot, if you realize how many opportunities you have, every single letter that you read in the Torah is considered a mitzvah. Letter, not word, not sentence. Every letter you read in the Torah is considered a mitzvah. You read one sentence, average, maybe 20, 20 letters. You just collected 20 of these giant endless rewards for one verse. So when you realize how much you can collect, you realize a lot, but what do you do? You're lazy. You're like, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do my side later. I'll study tomorrow. I'll study tomorrow. Uh, I can't study today 15 minutes. I'll study tomorrow half hour. All right, Hashem? I got to watch baseball now. I got to get some sleep. I got to go work. I got to do this. I got to do that. But if I told you, listen, you're going to go collect $15 million in the same amount of time that's going to take you to do uh, Tefilat Mincha, you're already putting three pieces of suit, three piece suit on. With the by the time I finish saying it, you put the uh, tie, the suit. You're ready. Cause why? We don't realize that the reward is great. We don't realize that there's diamonds around us because we can't see them. Elisha Navi was the student of Eliyahu Navi. At one time, the king of the Goim at the time heard about Eliyahu and Avi and he said, listen, bring him here, I want him to work for me. Eliyahu and Avi obviously said, no, not interested, thank you, goodbye. They offered him money, they offered him reward, they offered him this, they offered him that. Eliyahu and Avi does not work for the Goim. He only works for Hashem. And for his nation, Am Yisrael. So obviously this king with his pride being higher than the clouds didn't like to take a no for an answer. So okay, we're going to kill him. But since he's, uh, people are scared, this, that, what are we going to do? We're going to bring our entire army. Not just one person. We're going to bring the entire army to kill this one prophet. One guy. An old man with a stick, we're going to bring the entire army with horses and spears and this and that. They bring the entire army and they surround the mountain that Eliyahu Navi is living in. And Elisha Navi comes outside and he sees all these horses and spears and helmets. People are oozing saliva like rabid dogs looking forward to killing Eliyahu and Avi. And he goes to Eliyahu and Avi and says, What are we going to do? We're surrounded. And Eliyahu and Avi says to him, Not to worry. We're greater than they are. We're a much bigger army than theirs. Eliyahu and Avi didn't like he didn't have emunah issues or anything, but he just went outside five seconds ago. He didn't see any army. All the army he saw is the goyim. He's like, 
כבוד הרב, יש שיון מי? אליהו נביא זוהר. אז הוא מתחיל לפרעים לאלוהים, אלוהים, please make him see. please make him see. His prayer gets answered and he says to Elisha, go, go outside. Again. And he goes outside and he still sees all of these giant army. But on top of the mountain, he sees an army thousands of times greater, full of angels of fire, with their spears of fire and their horses of fire. waiting for these people to peep the wrong way. Now before he went out there, was the army there? It was there, right? When he was there the first time, was the army there? It was there. So just because he didn't see it, does that mean that it wasn't there? No. Just because you don't see Hashem's ultimate solution to your problem does that mean he doesn't have one just because you don't see the reward just yet that Hashem plans to give you for all of eternity including some in this world does that mean it's not there the most important thing that a person needs to understand is Is that emuna is not seeing a shem's work and then saying wow no that's knowledge that you saw a shem's creation it's in front of you you go to the rocky mountains you see giant mountains that are like it's massive obviously whatever created them must be bigger you look at the world just to Just the sea. The sea. You see how massive it is. 70-something percent, 73 percent of the entire Earth, planet Earth, is water. We don't know everything even about the land. Let alone know everything about the water that we're surrounded by. But you see how massive it is. One wave can destroy a town. One wave. And that's not even one percent of one percent of the sea. massive whoever created that is much bigger you see some of the create creatures that live in it these huge whales bigger than buildings and there's fishing eating little planktons zillions of them no one's worried about panasa no one's worried about their mortgage they just open their mouth and the food comes in You see the world from the outside, from a satellite. See this sphere. Gemarai in Masechet Avodah Zarah shows that Chazal already knew that the world was a sphere 2,000 years before we had the telescope. As a matter of fact, even in the Rambam, the Rambam already talked about in Ilchot Tshuvah, And uh, also in a um, uh, Mishneh Torah, in his book Mishneh Torah, 900 years ago, he already wrote the exact number of planets. Nine planets that we have. And then he said there's also other spheres around it, which he, he's referring to the moons that each one of them have. And he says each one of them is a sphere and he gives exact details it's no telescope how do you know this stuff you can't see it you can't see Mars he gave it names he says there's one that's closer to the Sun than us and he gives exactly locations of where each one is how do you know this stuff 900 years ago Galileo Galilei was 350, 360 years ago. This is almost 600 years. Before we had a telescope, where do you get this stuff? 
Gemara Masechet Avoda is even a thousand years before him. The Zohar, 500 years before them. We already know all this stuff. Because the one who put it there told us in Mount Sinai. And when you look at the sphere rotating in the same spot at approximately 1700 miles per hour without moving 1% right or 1 degree left, see how amazing it is. How perfect. If it moves 1 degree closer to the sun, we all burn. 1 degree further from the sun, we all freeze. 1 degree. Not 30, not 50, 1. And then you see a recent picture that NASA published, the biggest picture of the universe ever published, and you see how tiny Earth is in comparison to just our own galaxy, let alone everything. Tiny, it's not even a dot. It's not even a dot on a big picture. It's a dot within a dot within a dot within a dot. You actually need a microscope to see the dot. And you're one of the few million that it was all created for. You're one of the few million that it was created for. It wasn't created for the shark. It wasn't created for the whale. It wasn't created for the horse. It wasn't created for the star. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Chaya Achat Omedet Barakia Ushma Yisrael. Rabbi Akiva says, there is an angel in the middle of the sky, and its name is Israel. And on its forehead is written Israel. And each day it says, Baruchu et Hashem HaMevorach. Its job is to praise Hashem and scream out, Praised is the Lord. And all of creation responds, Baruch Hashem Evorach Lolam Vaid. This giant fire, this angel is full of fire. He's the size of a planet or more. He's in the middle of the endless sky. And his only job is to say, Baruch Hu Hashem Evoach. And everyone responds, just like you do twice a day in tefillah. In the morning, in shachrit, and at night in arvit. That's why if you, pl- if you pray be'yachid, that's the, you say this midrash, it's a to say this midrash. even though he's so big and even though he's so great and even though he's amazing you're better you're more valuable your mitzvah is much more valuable than the one he's fulfilling because the world was created for you so when Rabbi Tafana is telling you the reward is great he's not joking The opportunity is extraordinary. And that's why the master of the house, Hashem Yitbarach, is insistent. He keeps pushing. No, you can do Kriyat Shema. No, wake up already. It's 6.30. Wake up at 7. Wake up at 7.30. Wake up Hashem Yitbarach. It's 9.30. Wake up already. Do tefillin before you run out of time. Get out of work already. You have to get home before Shabbat starts. One second difference. One second. As we talked about last week, Shiu, changes a mitzvah of Adlakat Nerot, lighting the candles, to a Surkaret, Karet, the worst possible sin in Judaism, lighting fire on Shabbat. One second you're late. You light the candles. One second. You want to do mitzvah. You're late. It's not a mitzvah. It's the worst sin. 
So the master keeps reminding you. You ever wonder why you wake up in the middle of the night? Especially men. Went to sleep. You have school tomorrow. You have work tomorrow. You have this. You have that. But you went to sleep at some normal time. But you woke up at 2. And you can't go back to sleep. You ever wonder why? How many of you wondered? Raise your hand. Two, three, four, five. Okay, so all of you. You know why? It's supposed to open a book. Shem's like, okay, you didn't learn enough to art today. Open a book for a half hour. Talk to me. Say something. But you don't say. We go back to sleep. Tired. You wake up a half hour later. It's 2.30. Same again, it's telling, no. Gemara, Masechet Bachot, page 32. No, finish it. No, finish it. No, oh, tired. No, let me roll over. Let me drink some water. Six times you woke up that night. The next day, you're like half dead. You're not even sure why. Ah, oh, I didn't sleep all night. Woke up all night. You can't even say you achieved anything. But what's going to happen? The day is going to come, you're going to be in front of the judge. The judge said, how come you didn't finish page 32, Masechet Brachot? How come you didn't finish the Shas one more time? Hashem, I didn't have time. What do you mean you didn't have time? I woke you up. You know how many times I woke you up? You know how many times I tried to wake you up? You don't really need to sleep nine hours. You can sleep a little less, especially when you're young. You can sleep a little less. Rambam says sleep eight. If you are if you get used to it, you can sleep much, much less than that. But the point is, is that if he's waking you up, there's a reason. So in the next Mishnah, Rabbi Tafon continues. He says, Lo alecha melecha ligmo, velo ata ben chorin li batel mimena. Im lamalta Torah arbe, notnim lecha sachar arbe. ונאמן הוא בעל מלאכתך שישלם לך שכר פעולתך ודע שמתן שכרן צדיק, של צדיקים לעתיד לבוא. So Rabbi Tarfon continues He adds in essence a comment on his own previous Mishnah. He says you're not required to complete the task we'll explain in a second what that means yet you're not free to withdraw from it. If you've studied much Torah, they give you great reward. And your employer can be relied upon to pay you the wage of your labor, but be aware that the reward of the righteous will be given in the world to come. Said that. When Moshe Rabbeinu went to Mount Sinai, he didn't sleep for 40 days. The Midrash Shemot Rabbah 47.7 says the reason why he didn't sleep for 40 days, 40 nights, is because he actually knew how valuable time was. And how every single second that he's there, he could be learning with Hashem Barach. Just like us. Rabbi Tafon is telling you, obviously at this point, you've read the last one, you're overwhelmed. You look at the Shas for the first time, you want to have a heart attack. In the beginning, you just look at books, it all looks easy. Like, ah, it's books. I've read, I read books before. I read Harry Potter a few times. You open the Shas, you want to have a heart attack. You're like, how does somebody read this? This is Hebrew? This is English? What is this? What language is this? Any language you want. You want it in English, we'll put it in English. Our school made it easy for you. You want Hebrew, make it Hebrew. You want th- whatever you want. Just read it. Either way, it doesn't matter what language. It's still hard. You start looking at it. 
By the time you finish your first Masechet, I know from my experience, you feel like you're Moshe Rabbeinu. Like, wow! But then, you finally learn that there's more. You, just, you felt like your first Masechet, you, you felt like you finished of Shas. It's like it's 30 pages, 60 pages, nothing. You have a couple of thousand more, 2,600 more. When you realize that you want to have a heart attack, like 2,600 more of this? But then you realize, that's just the Gemara. What about the Midrashim? What about the Shulchan Aruch? What about all the details, Yakut Yosef, Sifret Sadiki, Musar? The library keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it looks impossible. It looks like there's too many mitzvot. You first start doing tshuva. Somebody told you Shabbat. It sounded scary. Okay, so you start keeping Shabbat. What do you do? You sleep most of the day. You go to the Knesset for a couple of hours. You eat. Easy enough. It's a vacation. But then, after a few months of doing this, people tell, okay, listen, you can't just keep Shabbat. You have to actually go to the Knesset during the week too. What do you do then during the week? You eat also? No, no, no food during the week. So what do you do? You pray. Oh. How long? Eh, an hour. 45 minutes in the morning. In the afternoons, another half hour. At night, usually it's the same thing. Oh, it's a lot of praying. Like, yeah, but not even half of it. Well, what else? We kind of have to do a prayer every time you do something. What do you mean? If you smell something good, you have to make a prayer. What else? If you want to eat something, you have to pray. What else? After you finish eating, you have to say thank you. You have to do an even longer prayer. And you learn this one mitzvah, and one mitzvah, another one, another one. It becomes so overwhelming. And you get all these rules and it becomes like, oh, this is too much. And you become frozen. This is the reason why in the beginning... If you look at the Shulchan Aruch, Ilchot Gerim, the Alachot, the laws of converts, they say that if a non Jew comes to the rabbis and he says, I want to convert to be a Jew, the response, this is, I believe, the third Alacha, the response, by the rabbis is, yes, but you know that we are a persecuted nation. They kill us, they beat us up, they enslave us. We're not exactly popular. And you know that now you're allowed to do whatever you want on Shabbat, but if you light fire on Shabbat after you convert, it's death penalty. Even though there's no Bet HaMikdash, there's no Sanhedrin anymore, it's a heavenly death penalty. You could, chas shalom lose part of your life, die young, have your spouse die, have your kids die. It's no joke. People think that uh, 20 year old kids are dying just because. Well, it's not just because. Things are happening for a reason. Somebody made a sin. There's no suffering without sin. Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 55 talks about how there's different levels of suffering. And it says, when you do a chet, you do a sin that's unintentional, versus avon, which is an intentional sin. For unintentional sin, unintentional sin, because now we don't have the Bet HaMikdash anymore, in heaven they decree death penalty. But for an intentional sin, you get suffering. Now the first time I heard this, I'm like, no, no, I read this wrong. This is supposed to be the opposite. Unintentional sin should be suffering. So I continue living and do tshuva. Because it's unintentional. I, by accident, I turn on the light on Shabbat. Accident, I didn't do it on purpose. It was a reflex. You know, you leave the bathroom, automatically your hand works. It's like a robot of its own. It's got a... Automatically. That's why you have to put those plastic pieces to block it. There's little plastic pieces for $3. 
each one's highway robbery, but whatever, you got to put something there. Either plastic tape or a plastic piece. And you block the switch because your hand will go there. It's a natural reflex that you have already after you've gone to the bathroom a million times. Your hand's going to go there at one point or another. So to stop yourself, put a fence around the fence. So, but if you made this sin before you got this plastic piece, before you came to the lecture and you learned about this $3 piece, it's going to stop you from a sin. I'm not in the business of making those plastic pieces. You can just buy them online. But anyway, before you make, uh, before you do that, you made a sin. It's unintentional. In Shemaim, they say, death penalty for unintentional sin. It's very confusing to me. I've read this the first time. How is this possible? And then if it's intentional, meaning you knew it, Shabbat. You knew it. Not only you turn on the light, you went and drove. Went, drove. I'm going to the mall. Going to the beach. They say for that you get suffering. It's very hard for me to understand that. Until I started reading what Chazal was talking about. And Chazal, in the Gemara, says this. There's no death without transgression. There's no suffering without sin. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 20, it says, Anefesh achotet itamut. Ben lo yisa ba'avon ha'av ve'av lo yisa ba'avon ha'ben tzidkat ha'tzadik alav tiyeh. Ve'ishat arasha alav tiyeh. In the book of Ezekiel it says, The soul that sins it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, nor shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous one shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked one shall be upon him. Chazal explains that when a person makes a sin that causes a death penalty, Rashi says, when it's a unintentional sin, the only punishment is to get death penalty. reason why is because it's unintentional they don't want the person to lose his olam haba so they remove him from the world Hashem removes him from the world it's unintentional the death is his repentance so why give suffering for an intentional sin because number one, you have to pay for the sin to some extent. But number two, you want him to stay in the world. As a form of punishment, as we read from uh, the Parashat uh, Vayetchanan, book of Deuteronomy, Parashat Vayetchanan, Hashem says that He pays His haters, the ones that are intentionally sinning, He calls His enemies or His haters. He pays them in this world any reward, but he also makes sure that they don't have a share of the world to come. So if they've run out of reward, he starts punishing them. But not to death penalty, because he wants them to stay in this world and continue sinning. So the punishment gets worse. In... uh, Ramba Milchot Tshuva, chapter 9, verse 1, or Alakha 1. It says that just like the uh, mitzvot, mitzvah, goeret, mitzvah, each mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, each sin leads to another sin. Meaning that part of the punishment is for you to make another sin. Because the ultimate punishment is coming. But at the same token, we're also going to learn from this very same halacha from the Rambam of what true reward is. 
So Rabbi Talfon is telling you that once you look at this entire Shas, you look at this entire mitzvot, it becomes overwhelming. When the Goy comes to the rabbis and he says, I want to convert, they know that. You tell them all of the mitzvot, you tell them all of the Shas, you tell them everything, it's too much. So they tell them, listen, if you drive on Shabbat, death penalty. Now you can drive whatever you want, but if you convert, you drive. It's a problem. If you eat non-kosher now, enjoy mabruk, tavon, eat whatever you want, just as long as it's not alive and moving. Because that will violate the seven laws of Noah. But if you're a Jew, you can't eat anything that moves. And even if it doesn't move, you still can't eat it unless it's kosher. So he says, okay, what if it's not even alive? So it could be even worse. What do you mean? What if it's just a uh, carrot? What if it's just the leaves of uh, spinach? So it could potentially be even worse. Why? Because it could be worms. So you have to clean it. Eating a worm is like eating pig five times. Just be careful. That's why in Pesach that's coming up is not Hashem. Part of it is to eat a lot of these vegetables. You have to make sure that you go online and you learn how to thoroughly clean these if you don't already know how to clean them. Don't just rinse them in the water five minutes and that's it. It's a process. You take, let's say for example, any, any of the vegetables, especially the ones that are leafy, you put them, you wash them, rinse them out. Then you put them into a bowl with soap, soap water. And you leave them there for several minutes. You take them out, there's a few different strategies that you can learn, either hot water, or cold water, with soap. Long story short, there's plenty of videos online to teach you how to clean these vegetables. I'm not an expert on it, my wife is, but I can tell you that it's not two seconds. It's not like they do it at the restaurant. Two seconds, they wash it, and it looks like it's clean because it's uh, dripping water. Absolutely not, because you eat one worm, you're thinking you're doing mitzvah for Pesach. You eat maro. You think you're doing a mitzvah, in reality you're making a huge sin. So you have to be very, very careful. So that's also why you shouldn't, if you're not experienced as far as doing a uh, Pesach, you should really study a lot before Pesach, or if you can, go to a, uh, let's say if there's like a local uh, synagogue that's having an event, if it's within your budget, eat with them. Like if it's, I don't know, a uh, Chabad or any of these uh, Batek Neset that have like a community event, if you don't know what you're doing, go there. Don't just have Pesach by yourself. It's just you and, I don't know, maybe one of your friends. And neither one of you guys just did Chuba last week. And they're both eating my thing you're doing mitzvot. No, there's a lot of halachot for Pesach. Make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, and if you don't, you have enough time to study. It's not rocket science. But the point is, don't just come into Pesach thinking you're just going to read the, the uh, Haggadah and everything's going to be okay. You have to prepare. So, the... Uh, the point here is that when the convert prospect comes to the rabbis, he says, yeah, I want to convert. It's like, yeah, but you're taking a big risk here. It's like, yeah, yeah, but that nation, I want to be part of them. So the actual halacha, shulchan aruch, shulchan aruch halacha, even though we don't follow it anymore, the specific halacha, it's a very, very big disaster in this generation. And for some time now, but this is actual Allah in Shulchan Aruch says that they convert him on the spot and we don't teach him big mitzvot right away we don't give him too much meaning the guy just came he came to the rabbis he says I want to be a Jew they say listen then you're going to become part of uh, the victims of anti-semitism no problem then you can't drive on Shabbat. No problem. Then you have to eat kosher. No problem. Okay. Yalla, brit milah. Let's go. L'chaim. They convert him. That's it. The only debate is whether the conversion is completed that day or after his brit milah heals, which is 30 days later. But the conversion, the first part of the conversion is on the spot. He didn't go to classes like they do today. They spend five years in classes. He didn't go to classes. He doesn't even know Allah Shabbat yet. 
He doesn't know the five books of Moses by heart. He doesn't know anything. He just knows he wants to be a Jew. That's the actual halacha. Now, why doesn't anybody follow this halacha anymore? The halacha is somebody wants to be a Jew, you make him a Jew. Make it simple for them to be a Jew. We want more Jews. Actually, it's one of the prophecies in the Gemara, Masechet Abu Dazara, page 3b and 4a, that at the end of the times there will be many converts. Many, many converts before the Mashiach comes. But once the Mashiach comes, no more converts. Why? Because then it's going to be easy. Everybody's going to want to convert. So, in essence, fulfilling this halacha, making it simple for people to become Jewish, should be our initiative. But how come we don't do it? The reason we don't do it is because, unfortunately, there was a bunch of gerim, a bunch of converts that ruined it for everyone. Over time, there's been many, many fake converts where women would convert for men. Instead of converting for God, they convert for a boyfriend. She's converting because she wants to be with uh, Tzvika or Moshe. Or he's converting because he wants to be with Sarah. Yesterday was Mustafa, today he wants to be Abraham. Why? But not for God. He wants to be uh, Sarah's a, uh, boyfriend. And he knows that her father won't let it happen. So he converts. Problem is, these fake converts, as soon as they convert, the wedding goes through, the husband and wife, that's it. Their connection with God or Judaism ends at that point. They become kufrim, they don't go to Beknesset, they don't keep mitzvot, even if they keep, they keep minimal, and they become secular Jews in so many words, and it's a very, very big problem, because if their intention was really to convert just for a person and not for God on the day of the conversion, even though they fooled the Bedin, they didn't fool God, which means that all of the children are goyim. If it's a woman, then the kids are goyim. If it's a man, then the kids are still Jewish, but it's a problem. They're coming out of a sin. So a bunch of converts made it very, very difficult for people today. This is also part of the tikkun for converts anyway. But unfortunately, we went from one extreme to the other. We went from a halakha, it's supposed to be easy for people to convert. If anybody in their right mind knows what conversion is, you know that you're going to be persecuted. You know that you're going to be part of the underdog. Right now, underdog. Later on, Bezat Hashem, top dog. But right now, we're not exactly on anyone's top 10 favorite list. You want to join us? It's supposed to make it easy. That's the halakha. But they don't do it. Why? Because a bunch of people ruined it. But we went to the other extreme. And the other extreme is that many Bateddin make it almost impossible to convert. Mamas, the neshama of the person has to come out until he finally converts. He has to study for years. Some Bateddin, some of these rabbis make the uh, people study Hebrew, even though it's not Allah for them to learn Hebrew. I know one particular one that makes people study Hebrew. It takes years. Or they make them become scholars, like... You don't need to be a scholar. You just need to know basic. Basic. You know who God is. You know the brachot. So it makes it very, very, very difficult for people. And that's also why we have certain rabbis that have gone rogue. That pretty much are designed to convert people on their own. And basically following the halakha where you have three Jews saying, listen, you follow, you're going to follow the mitzvot? Yes. Follow, you, know, you ask them some questions. Everything's good. Go in a mikveh, chazak uboch, you're a Jew. Based on Allah, technically they're a Jew. The problem is that no one's going to accept this conversion. So even though this person went to the ocean, dipped in the mikveh, the rabbi told him that he's a Jew, if that rabbi is not recognized by the rabbanut in Israel, he may not care because he lives in America, he lives in Washington, he lives in Ohio, he lives somewhere else. He doesn't care. He's not planning on going and having aliyah. But one day he's going to have a kid. And that kid is not going to care about who his original rabbi that converted him and his reason for it, his reason not for it. That kid's going to grow up Jewish. And one day he's going to want to marry a Jewish girl. Or she's going to want to marry a Jewish boy. And they're going to arrive at the Chupai and Kiddushin. And the parents are going, oh, hold on a second, before we uh, finish everything off, aren't you a convert? Yes. Can you actually prove that? Can you show us the paperwork? And I show the paperwork, oh, wait a minute, this rabbi... No one knows who this rabbi is. He's not approved by the rabbanut. Your conversion is not valid. Your child is a goy. 
your kid's going to hate you forever. Because even though Allah, Allah wise, he's technically a Jew, society at large will not accept it. So you may not care, but your kid's going to care. So it's stupid to go do a conversion on your own outside of these accepted rabbinuts because even though it's politics, even though it costs money, even though it's annoying, even though, even though, even though, even though all these million and a half reasons of why it's not fair, it is what it is. It is what it is. You have to go through the system. And you have to pray that Hashem gives you this Yad Bishmai to help you along the way. Why? Because Rabbi Tafon is telling you you're not required to complete the task. If you actually want to convert, that desire alone, like if it's a real desire, not like you're telling somebody that you want to convert. Like you have a true desire to convert, but your situation makes it impossible. You can't move to a Jewish community. You can't afford it. You live in, I don't know, middle of Utah and you have no money to leave town. You live in the middle of uh, Texas and your next door neighbor for the next 20 miles are cows. You can't leave town. You don't have any money. Okay, no, no bad is going to convert you. I'm sorry. Why? Because you can't be a Jew by yourself. But you want to convert. You're studying Torah. You're learning what you need to do. Hashem will make a way. Hashem will, Hashem will pave your way. You're not required to complete the task. And what Abita Fon is telling you and the Baal Tshuva and every Jew out there is that just the fact, just the fact that you want it, is why you're going to get the reward. So, on the other hand, the Baal Tshuva that sees the Shas, sees the whole Gemara, sees it's too big, it's going to take, if I'm a genius, it's going to take me seven years to finish the Gemara, but then it's just the Gemara. Then it's going to take me another seven years to finish the Shulchan Aruch, but that's just the Shulchan Aruch. It's going to be another several years to finish all the Midrashim, and then this, and then I'm never going to finish it. He says, it's not for you to finish. Because even if you finish it once, it's nothing. You didn't finish it a hundred times, it's still nothing. You're still more to learn. Hashem didn't write the Torah for you to finish it. Hashem wrote the Torah for you to toil, to continue learning. Now if you say, ah, yes, it's too much, I'm just going to learn a little bit and once in a while. Rabbi Tafon says, no, my friend, you're not... Just because it's big, just because it's bigger than you, just because it's overwhelming, you don't have a right to not try. And the reason why is because it's not really an option. One of the most important things to know, whether you are a religious Jew or not, is to evaluate yourself next to the 13 principles of faith that the Rambam put together. 13 things that you must believe, where if you don't believe one of them, number one, they won't convert you if you're trying to convert, and number two, you can't really consider yourself a religious person or even a full, full-blown Jew. You're a kufel. Now, one of these things is called Reward and punishment. One of the 13 principles of faith, one of the foundations of Judaism is to believe that there is a reward and there's a punishment. And Rabbi Tafon is telling you here is that yes, Hashem made the Torah endless specifically because it's not for you to finish, but also made sure you know that you can't run away from it. You can't not study because it's too big. You can't not study because it's too much or you're not going to finish. You have to do it because you have to do it because the purpose of your being is to try. The reward is based on your effort, not the execution. 
the execution is determined by Hashem. Whether you actually succeed or not has nothing to do with you. Hashem decides. Hashem decides whether you're going to succeed in anything that you do or not. And that's why Shlomo HaMelech in Proverbs he writes Lech el anemala atzel rei darkea vechacham Shlomo HaMelech the smartest man, the wisest man of all time says to you and me something that's rather confusing. In chapter 6 of Proverbs, verse 6, he says, Go to the ant, you lazy person, you sluggard, see its ways and grow wise. Go to the ant, watch it work, stop being lazy, go watch it work, and then you'll be smart for it. I'm going to go learn, I mean, the ant, its brain is not even, you can barely see it in the microscope. I'm going to become smart by looking at an ant. Now Chazal tells us that anything that doesn't have a bone, doesn't have a skeleton, dies within less than a year. So an ant dies in less than a year. Some say the average is six months. But actually what you'll see is that during those six months, the amount of food that the ant collects is enough for for itself for 60,000 years. Meaning it collects more than enough food for the rest of its life during the first few hours it's alive. But it continues to work and work and work and work endlessly every day. It doesn't stop. Did you ever see a, a, an ant go on vacation? Did you ever see an ant show up at the travel agent and say, listen, you know what, I really want to go to Bahamas. Or this year we're going to go on a on vacation, we're going to take a cruise, make sure it's kosher. Did you ever see that? No, ant doesn't stop working. And Shlomo Melech is telling you, go learn from it. Why? Because the ant is not so concerned about the reward. It listened to the Mishnah from Antigonosh, Isocho, that said, serve Hashem as if there's no reward. Serve Him for the sake of serving Him because that's enough of a reward. The ant is not concerned with whether the task is hard or not. It just goes to work. If we just fulfill the mitzvah at hand, instead of thinking about all the other mitzvot we need to do, we'd achieve much more. Now the next thing that Rabbi Talfon is saying is that if you studied a lot of Torah, you'll get a great, a great reward for it. Now who can really say that they've achieved this part? How do you know it's a lot of Torah? How do you know you've actually achieved a lot of Torah? Why? It's because you know a few verses by heart. You know a few Gemarot. You could quote a few sages. You have a lot of books. A lot of people have a lot of books, by the way. Doesn't mean they actually read them. Usually, most people have a lot of books. A lot of those books are brand new. How do you know you achieved? One of the signs is if you fulfilled what the Gemara Masechet Brachot, page 63b, says someone that wants to become a Talmud Chacham has to be willing to die for it. Meaning sacrifice their neshama, their body, their soul, their everything, just for another page Gemara. Just for another Parashat Shavua. They're not worried about sleeping eight hours a day, ten hours a day, five hours, they're not worried about anything. They're just worried about, I'm going to exert every bit of myself for the next bit of mitzvot, for the next Gemara, for the next page, for the next Chidush. How do you know you're really doing that? Shlomo HaMelech also told you this. In chapter 2, verse 4 of Proverbs, it says, Im tevakshena kekesef u kematmonim techapsena, az tavin yirat Adonai vedat Elohim timtza. 
if you seek it as if it were money, or if you search for it as if it were hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Hashem and discover knowledge of God. Meaning, if you're still chasing money as your number one priority in your life, you're not going to be a Talmud Chacham. Don't, don't even waste your time thinking you're going to be a Talmud Chacham. Just let it go. Or get yourself together and realize, okay, you got to stop chasing money so much. If money is the number one thing you think about when you wake up in the morning, you're not on the right path to be Talmud Chacham. If the first thing you think about when a car moves in front of you is like, wow, what an amazing car. Your mind is not exactly in the direction of where Talmud Chacham is supposed to be going. If you're chasing the next Daf Gemara, like it's money, like the rest of the world chases money, you're chasing that Daf Gemara. If you're chasing the next Chidush, like it's a hidden treasure, you can't wait to find it, you're willing to like bleed from your eyes till you, all night until you find this chidush of what does Moshe Rabbeinu mean? Then you're on the right path. Then you have a chance to know what is Yirat Shamayim. Then you have a chance of knowing God. Not just believing. And know that your employer can be re- relied upon to pay you the wage of your labor, but be aware that the reward for the righteous will be given in the world to come. So Abita Fon finishes up the Mishnah with this. He says, don't worry, everything that you're doing, Hashem's going to pay you for it. We already said it in the first Mishnah, but he's reminding us again, Hashem's going to take care of you. But I forgot to mention one thing last time, he says, that real payment, like he's going to pay you a little bit here and there. He's going to give you down payment, house, a kid, a wife, a husband, a few friends, some books. He's going to pay you a few things here and there. Maybe a building. But the real reward, it's not here. I didn't mention it in the first Mishnah, he says. The second Mishnah he's going to mention. He goes, just no, you can rely on a payment. Why do I keep mentioning you can rely on the payment? Because if you're waiting for it here, you didn't get my point the first time. So let me remind you. The real payment for the righteous is not here. It's in the world to come. But now, we have two questions. Number one, can we understand what the reward in the world to come is? in our human mind. And the second question is, okay, so what's the guaranteed reward here? Okay, fine. I get it. Big reward, world to come. You know anybody that came back and told you what it was? You know, that's what people tell me all the time. You know anybody that came back and told you? I need something here. I need some cash. Give me some down payment. What do you got? So can we understand the truth of what the world to come is? No, we can't. As I mentioned to you earlier today, all of the good of all the people that ever existed is not even one hour of the world to come. I could say it 500 times. Will you understand it? No, I don't understand either. We don't understand that level of good. As a matter of fact, mankind knows more about bad than we do about good. I could explain to you suffering and pain, and most of you will understand what I mean, at least to a certain extent. I can understand to you, uh, explain to you pleasure, but most people won't understand pleasure. I can tell you that every time I open the Daf Kama, I open the Mishnah, I open one of Sidu, Humash, I feel good, I feel amazing. Some people are like, Steve, what, is something wrong with you? You know, a guy never opened Humash, it's like, why are you so excited about Moses? Something wrong with you? Like, you won't understand what that pleasure is. But if I tell him, oh, by the way, you know, I had, uh, I, I lost the amount of, uh, the count of how many surgeries I had and how many needles I had to shoot myself with and how many pills I had to take and I had to bleed and this, I told him all my surgery story. Everyone understands that. Everyone understands that I was screaming my lungs out after the first surgery, the second surgery, the third surgery, the fourth surgery. Everyone understands that pain to a certain extent. But if I tell him, listen, 
I enjoy the first sentence of this week's parasha more than my first 26 years of my life. You're not going to understand that. No one's going to understand that unless they were in it. So the answer to the first question is, can you understand Olam Abba? Sadly, no. But the good news is that the reward that you get here for really fulfilling the mitzvot of Hashem Barach will give you an understanding of Olam Abba. But you have to understand what the reward really is. Now the Rambam in Ilchot Tshuva 9.1 He says that when one gets money or something material as a reward from Shemaim for one of the mitzvot that they did the first thing they have to acknowledge is that the money is not the reward. It's not even a down payment on the reward. It's too small. Even if Hashem gives you a million dollars, a billion dollars, whatever it is, it's not the real reward. What it is, is it's fulfilling the promise that mitzvah goeret mitzvah, which is one mitzvah leads to another. Meaning, Hashem saw that you gave tzedakah. He saw you're generous and you want to fulfill the, the mitzvah of tzedakah. He says every time you get money, you're fulfilling the mitzvah of ma'asel. You give 10%. You get $4,000 a month in income. You're fulfilling the mitzvah as it's written, not as unfortunately many people do it today, is they take off all of the expenses, which is 3,800 out of the 4,000. So they have $200, they give 10% of the $200. So they give 20 bucks a month. That's not really the way you're supposed to do ma'asel. The way you're supposed to do ma'asel is out of the gross, because that forces you to have emunah. So you get $4,000 a month, let's say. I'm just giving you an example. $4,000 a month in income. You're supposed to, right off the bat, take $400. That's the mass sale. That is the tithe. That is where Hashem says, test me. You're not allowed to test me with anything else, but for that, you're allowed to test me. I guarantee that you will actually reach wealth. You'll become rich in this life if you give mass sale on a regular basis forever. Sometimes you get rich after a year, sometimes you get rich after many years, but the point is, Hashem guarantees you will become rich if you do this. So, if Hashem sees that you're doing it, you're getting a check, you don't even know if you have enough for all of your expenses, but you know that, you want to fulfill this mitzvah, you're excited about this mitzvah, you're not thinking about it twice, you take the 4000 4, you take $400 out of it, you give $400 towards some type of Torah-related item, Obviously, you're not giving it to the local alcoholic. You're giving it to something related to Hashem. And you do this on a regular basis. And Hashem says, oh, wow, look how excited he or she is about giving the ma'asel. Let me give them more money. So they give more ma'asel. That's what it means, mitzvah, gwerat mitzvah. You made a mitzvah, so Hashem says, oh, so let me give you an opportunity to make even a bigger mitzvah. You like this mitzvah of mine so much, let me give you more of it. You know, it's like you go to your mom's house, you haven't been there in a while, and your mom says, oh honey, you hungry? It's the first question every mother asks. Honey, you hungry? You're not allowed to say no, obviously. Even if you ate five, you know, buckets full of chicken right before you got there, you're still not allowed to say no. You're like, oh yeah, I'm starving, Ima. You show up, you take a bite. What is your mom's dream? After you take the first bite, wow, amazing, delicious. Why? Because as soon as you finish the word delicious, she put three more plates on your oven. She's giving you, why? Because you like my food so much, I'm going to give you more. You understand? Hashem Barach is saying, you like my mitzvot so much, you like to give money away to fulfill the mitzvot of myself, let me give you more money. You like learning my Torah? Let me give you more insights that will lead you to learn even more. Let me give you more strength so you can actually be awake for longer and learn more. Oh, you fulfilled my mitzvah of marriage? Let me give you an opportunity to fulfill another mitzvah. It's called children, raising them. Every single time you fulfill a mitzvah, Hashem rewards you with another mitzvah. So when he gives you money, or he gives you a building, 
or he gives you a wife, or he gives you children, that is not the actual reward. That is another opportunity to generate a bigger reward. When is that reward? The ultimate reward is in the next world. But the reward that you're seeing here, the Rambam says that's not the real reward, Bechlal. That's just enabling you to make more mitzvot. But also, sadly, it's the same token with sins. Hashem Elohim, when someone makes a sin, Hashem says, oh, you don't like watching your eyes, huh? You watch the Shul Torah, it says, watch your eyes, you don't like watching your eyes. Okay, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send the girl to you. I'm going to give you another test. You didn't want to watch your eyes, so now I'm going to make that girl like you then. Now you have a serious problem. Because now your eyes are turning into action. Then you turn in action. She likes you. You like her. Shem Yachem. Says, oh, you made another sin. Okay. Now I'm going to wake you up for another sin. She's going to tell you she's not Jewish. But you're already in love with her. What are you going to do then? And one sin becomes another and another. And Shem Yachem, that's how somebody can lose his share of the world to come. It's a very, very dangerous situation. Now, here's the best part, in my opinion, of the reward that if we take it into account, we could already truly feel Olam Abba here. Now, obviously, having children, wife, husband, a little bit of money, see upon us, all those things are wonderful. But not everyone gets all of this. Some Jews are wealthy, some are not. Some are married, some are not. Some have children, some don't. Doesn't necessarily mean they're all wicked. So, if we actually dig deep down someone that's fulfilling the Torah, that not only learns it, but actually lives it. I wrote down I think this is no less than 50 different character traits that he's guaranteed to get as a result of his learning Torah. Just as a result of fulfilling Torah as a man or a woman, this is what you get. First and foremost, you get inner peace. Because when you live with Hashem as your direction, your purpose, your everything, that already gives you inner peace that you're, there's, there's a reason for you to be in this world. Where if there is difficulty in life, you know he's the boss. He's, he's running the show. He knows what he's doing. He's been here for a while. You know that something, somehow, it's going to be okay. All right, it's not fun. Okay, it's depressing. Okay, it's difficult. But you know that there's an inner peace inside you when you're living and you're connected to Torah. You know, you know what? I know you know what you're doing, Hashem. Just if you don't mind, let me know. At your earliest. That is, by itself, is a, a, pair, a share of the world to come. But living here. That inner peace, that comfort that you actually have, that someone's watching, it's invigorating. Second, learning Torah is intellectually stimulating. No one that's ever... Learn Torah has ever said it's boring. Ever. Really learn Torah. Yeah, if you try it in the beginning, in the beginning when you first start learning Torah, it's so difficult you don't understand anything sometimes. Or if you're learning the wrong Torah, meaning that you're learning something that's completely not applicable to you, or at a higher level than you are, then it could be torture. But if you're learning the right Torah for you, even from day one, it's intellectually stimulating. It keeps your mind moving and the deeper you get into it, the more your mind works and it sharpens your brain. I'm going to go briefly in all these because there's a lot. There's over 50 different things. Next thing is you're able to achieve purity. Meaning that you can become a masha pure person. Like someone that is clean. Clean of sin. Clean of the grossness of the outside. Of how people are just not necessarily physically dirty. But you just sense that people are just dirty. They're very, very, they chase sins. They chase bad stuff. When you're connected to the Torah, you feel bad for them. 
you feel bad for anyone that even wants that. The next thing is, is that when you learn Torah, you're forced at some point if you're going to live it. If you learn it like it's a history book, then none of this applies to you. But if you're learning it in order to live it, in order to fulfill it, it's going to force you to develop your behavior. So the first and most important thing is behavior development, which by itself would make you a better person over time. Next, maturity. You can't be a little baby learning Torah. There's no babies in the Torah. It'll force you to be mature. So in today's unfortunate loser generation of entitled kids that think that at the age of 25 they're already supposed to have a house and uh, you know a job that pays them $150,000 a year just because they graduated college, because they got a trophy for every competition they ever failed at, the reality of it is that in real life, there's no such thing. In real life, you achieve based on your actual achievement. You're, you're, you're actually, you, uh, I'm sorry, you attain based on your actual achievements. So meaning that you're only going to get a reward if you won. So by learning Torah, you're learning from previous experiences. You're learning things that are difficult to hear. You're learning some things that are pleasant to hear but it forces you to mature. Next thing is clarity. That to me personally, once I had a little bit of version of it, when I started learning Torah, by itself was worth learning Torah. To have clarity, it's not just having clarity of just your own independent purpose in life, but it's to have clarity of just the overall world around you. Like sometimes things don't make sense. You don't understand, why is this guy even alive? Like, he's so evil, he's so bad, he's so this, he's so that. Like, why did Hashem bring him to the world? Why did Hashem create bugs? Why did Hashem create the cow? Why, you know, you start asking questions, and when you don't have Hashem, you don't have the Torah as a guide, you have no idea. So you just ask questions, and eventually you just lose hope. And it's very, very easy to become depressed, and it's very easy to see everything blurry. Everything just becomes dull. You just live life like it's a thing. It's a thing to do because you're alive. And you can waste your life that way. So that clarity, that clarity will affect you everywhere. It will affect you at work where you'll know you'll, you're will you not going to waste time on certain things that are mindless and a waste of time. You're going to value your time. You're going to also have clarity in regards to what you want in life. Whether you're going to get married, you're not going to get married. Whether she's the right one, he's the right one. You know what You know what you want. And one of the most difficult things that I see in a lot of young people, and some old, but mostly young people, is they have no idea what they want. Some of them come to me to help them with shiduchim, which is not my expertise, and nor do I want it to be my expertise, but I meet a lot of people. So they ask me to help them with shiduchim. The problem is they have no idea what they want. So when I introduce them to someone, and they complain about this person, it's like, ah, oh. you know, like, the last thing I ever wanted was to help you with the shiduch, and now you're complaining to me about it? So what's the problem? They have no idea what they want. They know what they are, but they have no idea what they want. So that clarity, you'll definitely get as a result of gluing yourself to the Torah. Next thing is for anyone that's already married, if you're actually gonna fulfill the Torah, you're gonna have Shalom Bait. Yes, there's ups and downs. Yes, of course, you're gonna have sometimes that are more difficult than others. You're gonna have different tests, but when you have Shalom Bait, you're able to achieve your ultimate purpose. You're able to have that partner that's gonna be able to enable you to get to a higher level that you can't get to by yourself. Remember, you each come to the world as half a soul. Your soulmate completes you. Why are they called soulmate? Why is your wife or husband called a soulmate? Because that's the other half. Together, you'll be able to achieve your ultimate purpose. By yourself, you can't achieve it. Next is child development. This is obviously great. This is, you know, for any new parents, myself included, main place that I get, only place really that I get a, uh, uh, any instructions of how to raise my kids is using the, the Torah as an instruction set. It's the only way to, to really understand why Hashem made certain kids more difficult than others, certain kids smarter than others, and so on, or, you know, how to deal with them. Someone's asking online, I happen to see it, why did Hashem create uh, radical Muslims? For the same reason that Hashem created 
anything that goes against Am Yisrael, they, they are one of his tools. If Am Yisrael are fulfilling the mitzvot and are doing the will of Hashem, Hashem will reward them with all the goodness in this world and the next. If they don't, before Hashem destroys anyone eternally, obviously he gives them warnings. So to the nation as a whole, he already promised us not to destroy us, but he has to wake us up. He uses the Muslims, the radical Muslims, or the uh, uh, radical Christians, or the radical anyone else that hates Jews, uh, as tools to wake us up. They're the stick. They're the stick. If we do what Hashem wants, we have no problem. If we don't, then Hashem has to use a stick to hit us a few times to wake us up. Now, next thing is business acumen. You want to be an expert in business? Learn Torah. It'll sharpen your mind. Your mathematical skills will become excellent because you're forced to do some math in your, in your, in your head. Uh, aside from that, it'll also clear up your brain. You'll be able to break down complex situations into simple formulas. Now, why does that matter in business? Because in business, in order for you to be really successful, you have to be able to explain very, very difficult things to the average idiot. Because your customer will be the average idiot. He's not going to be smart like you. He doesn't understand what CRM means. You understand what CRM means. You understand that it means client relationship manager. He doesn't understand what that means, client relationship manager. You understand that S&P means standard and poor is 500. He doesn't understand that. You understand that a PE means price over ratio, price over earnings ratio, which is a multiple to evaluate whether the company's stock is expensive or cheap. He doesn't understand it. So if you learn Torah, especially Gemara, you're going to already be forced to explain, learn yourself in a way to explain this very, very difficult thing and break it down into a simple way. So you'll be able to apply it in other parts of your life, including business. Confidence. You'll never have a reason not to be confident. Your father is God. It doesn't get better than that. You know, everybody says, hey, listen, you should be careful. You know who my father is? Who, who is your father? He's the principal of the school. Everybody's like, oh, 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 oh you're principal of the school. Your father's God. Why wouldn't you be confident? He loves you. He cares about you. He gives you everything you want. Why wouldn't you be confident? Aside from that, you also develop intellect. You'll develop a lot of good character traits, which will give you uh, confidence. Just don't take it to your head to the point where you become arrogant. Next thing is faith. You'll have faith. You'll have emunah. You'll have the ability to know that things are going to be okay. Like there's someone that's running the world and there's a, there's a method to the madness. Craziness is going to happen one way or another. But when you know that someone's doing it, it'll give you peace of mind to just function in your own little world, your own microscopic world. Next thing is it'll force you to have patience. Because sometimes to develop a chidush can take you hours, weeks, months, or even years. Your own Torah insight can take a very, very long time to actually develop. It'll force you to be patient. Also to even understand something. Just understand what Chazal, what uh, Moses, what Abraham, what anybody actually is saying. Sometimes it takes time. It's not all sitting there in a neat way like these books on the shelves are. You know, it's... Sometimes it takes a while to really understand what does God really mean? Why did he do this? Why did he do that? Sometimes it'll take you to reading it five, six, seven, ten times. So the only way you're going to get yourself motivated enough to read it ten times is if you're patient. Patient is one of the most important skills you could have in life. Patience in marriage, patience in raising children, patience in business. Patient in relationships altogether. If you don't have patience, you're automatically unpleasing to everyone around you. A person that's that's not patient is practically unbearable to the world around them, because you force everyone else around you to walk on eggshells. You force everyone around you to be anxious because oh, when is he going to lose his patience on me? Next thing is you have self-help from the Almighty. People spend hundreds and hundreds and in some cases tens of thousands of dollars getting self-help, going to people like Tony Robbins, going to different types of mentors and, and, and uh, coaches and self-help uh, books of all kinds 
And the reality of it is, you don't need any of it. You can learn everything and anything that you want from the Torah. Different parts of the Torah, obviously, but nonetheless, from the Torah. And where is the advice coming from? The Almighty. Doesn't get better. Next thing is, you could learn experience without experiencing it. Most valuable experience is other people's experience. Because it doesn't cost you any money. Your experiences could be very, very expensive and painful. I had a friend, his name was Dave Pruitt. He had one guy, he had a big company, and uh, this one CFO made a $5 million mistake. $5 million mistake. Company lost $5 million. When it was discovered, he came to my friend Dave Pruitt's office with his resignation paper. Letter. I'm resigning, I'm sorry, I messed up, I lost the company $5 million. My friend Dave took the paper and ripped it up. He goes, are you kidding me? You're not going now. He goes, you don't want to fire me? He goes, after I spent $5 million sending you to school. You understand? Your experience is very valuable. So the best experience is the cheapest one. Who? Other people's experience. All the experience you could possibly want is in the Torah. Whether you're going to learn from the experience of the sages or the forefathers, or the 12 tribes, or the tzaddikim, or even the, your, your rabbis that are alive now, you can just see how they act. Experience from the Torah. Next thing is knowledge. Endless amount of knowledge. Anything and everything you want. Whether you want to know about astrology, or you want to know about science, you want to know about medicine, you want to know about health, you can learn every single one of those things in different parts of the Torah. This is still not even half the list. Purpose, living with a purpose. Uh, obviously, this is already something we, we've, uh, we've covered, but again, if you don't have a purpose, it may not seem to matter when you're young, or you're 15, 16, 20, 25 years old, doesn't care if you have a purpose, all you want to do is find a new girl, all you really want to do is beat this guy in a video game, all you really want to do is just get the next job. You know, it's simple things, that's your purpose. But in reality, at some point, when you grow up and mature, you're going to want to have a purpose. If you don't have a purpose, you're gonna to want to die. Because then life has no purpose, and therefore, as soon as something doesn't go your way, you'll want to commit suicide. So, having a purpose is definitely one of the things you'll achieve. In addition to that, you'll also achieve real wisdom. And wisdom is different than knowledge. Wisdom is, is a combination of knowledge with knowing how to apply it from experience. Now again, you could attain wisdom through two things. One is in a guaranteed way, which is by learning Torah. One is a not so guaranteed way, which is by just getting old. Now, the fact that it's not guaranteed to gain wisdom alone is enough of a reason not to wait till you get old. But again, who wants to wait so long? Next thing is achievement. Every single time you make a certain amount of money or you attain a certain amount of material wealth, in the beginning it's exciting. I could tell you that making the first million dollars that I made was, I guess, somewhat exciting. But doing it fifth time, sixth time, tenth time, didn't really mean anything. Things lose their value in the material world. They just lose their value. Eventually, you just don't care. Eventually, it's just a competition just to win. It has nothing to do with the actual, what you're attaining. Whereas with the Torah and with, with intellectual stimulation, with wisdom, with knowledge, Every new chidush, every new insight is going to give you this feeling that no material in the world could ever give you. Fortunately, that's the best I can do as far as explaining it because the only other way you can understand it is by doing it yourself. Having unity with your ancestors, having unity with history, feeling like you're part of creation from the beginning, not just you exist now independently. Uh, having unity with your current nation now, being part of a nation. I mean, many people in the world today are part of nothing. You know, like if, if someone is Chinese, they say, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I'm from China. But you say, are you part of the Chinese people? The answer most of the time is not necessarily the case. They're not necessarily part of the Chinese people. They're just Chinese. They don't feel like they're part of the people. They're not because they live in America, they live in China, let's say. They're not necessarily going to visit because they don't feel like they're one with the nation. They just, they happen to, it's a, like a race. But when you're Jewish, it's not a race. It's, it's a people, it's a lifestyle, it's a religion, it's a bunch of different things. So when you're a Jew, whether you like it or not, 
You're part of something. Something that's much bigger than you. Uh, next thing is, it forces you to be charitable. If you actually want to be righteous, you have to be charitable. You can't be cheap. You can't be stingy. What The Rambam says that if you have a problem with money, if you like money too much and you, like, you don't like to give it, then take some money, whatever you don't consider too much, because obviously you have a problem with money to begin with. So let's say, I don't know, take uh, $20. Instead of giving the $20 to one particular person and giving yourself a heart attack, take the $20, get change for singles. Get 20 singles and give it to 20 different people. Why? The reason why is number one, you're not gonna get a heart attack for giving $20 to one person. And number two, even more so, after giving to 20 people, you're gonna force yourself to learn and develop a feeling of the, uh, of actually what it feels like to give. You're gonna get yourself acclimated to giving get used to giving and that's one way to overcome your desire where after a while you keep doing this on a regular basis you're gonna have a much easier time giving and it was even more larger amounts next part is happiness real happiness happiness from the material world and I can tell you from experience is impossible people some people that I uh, know have endless amount of money most miserable people on earth not necessarily by default. Some of them are, you know, say they're happy, but in reality, they have a purposeless life. As soon as, if they didn't have their money, no one even, would even look at them. If they didn't have their money, no one would even acknowledge them. So, again, it's a, uh, having, a, having your whole life, your whole existence based on something that's temporary is not exactly a good existence and it definitely cannot help you achieve happiness. Fulfillment. Again, this is something, all, a lot of these things sound the same, but they're actually quite different. Fulfillment is just having a, uh, not just a, a purpose, overall purpose, but a fulfillment on a regular basis. Every day you feel like you've achieved something. Every day you feel like there was a reason for today to exist. Even if today was full of hardship, it has a higher purpose. It was kaparat avonot. I, you know, today was extremely difficult for me, so at least it fulfilled my purpose of Repenting. Okay, today was awful. I got a flat tire. I, the kid was crying. The other one was this. The other, you know, all these different things that happened to you. If you just live a secular life, you can just pretty much say today was sucks. Today sucks. Today was terrible. It was awful. There's no other. You, know, you pretty much say, oh, I wish today didn't exist. But if you're connected and glued to a shemit balach, even the bad day has a purpose. It's called kaparat avonot, a repentance for your sins. Guidance. Obviously, using Hashem and His Torah as a guide, it doesn't get better than that. It pretty much gives you a map of how to live life. It's a love letter from Hashem of how to go about your life, how to be successful, how to be happy, how to be uh, you know righteous, how to be generous, how to do anything and everything that's any good in this world, how to do it. And how to get most biggest guidance is how to get to Allah Abba. What's the directions? Excitement. If you're actually connected to the Torah, you'll never be bored. One of the problems that a lot of secular people that I know have, especially young ones, is they're constantly bored. They're forced to do an, uh, more things in a material world just so they don't kill themselves. Both mentally and physically, because they're so bored. They go on vacation, and as soon as the vacation starts, they're already bored, can't wait for the next vacation. You know, as soon as they bought something, they're bored of it, they want something new. They got a new car, they're already looking at the neighbor's car because it's newer, it's one day old, one day newer. It's, it's very easy to get bored when you're not constantly connected to Hashem. So when you're connected to Hashem, you're always going to be excited because there's always going to be something going on in your neshama, there's always going to be something going on in your mind. Almost done, no jealousy. If you want a chance at being resurrected, the days of Mashiach, you cannot have jealousy. So by learning Torah, you'll force yourself to eliminate your jealousy with the exception of one form of jealousy that you're allowed to have. You're allowed to be jealous of another person that knows more Torah than you. Other than that, you're never allowed to be jealous because being jealous is in essence a form of kfirah. It's a form of heresy because you're saying that Hashem made a mistake by giving him something and not giving it to you. So you can't learn Hashem's Torah and be a kofir at the same time. So it's like the same time that you can't be excited and sad at the same time. 
You can't be happy and mad at the same time. So if you ever have a problem, if you're ever really, really angry, and this is harder to do than, than it is to say, but if you're ever really, really angry, take a, take a baby and look at the baby. Serious. Take a little baby and look at the baby. You'll stop being angry. Because a baby will not will have an inclination to make anyone that looks at it, unless you're like, I don't know, Nazi Germany or something, but anyone that's normal will look at a baby and become happy. So if you have a baby around somewhere, I don't know if you have a baby like in, you know, running around somewhere or you just want to come over to my house, you can look at a baby for a few minutes. We charge only 10 bucks a baby. Um, then it'll, it'll, it'll stop you from being angry. But don't come to my house angry. So you just only pick up my baby if you're, if you're happy. So. Uh, so it'll eliminate that uh, jealousy. Next thing is driven. Driven, I mean, obviously, in order for you to be a Talmud Chacham, in order for you to achieve the, the purpose, you have to be driven. You can't get to a point of knowledge, you can't go to a point of purpose by being lazy bum. You have to be driven. You have to be ambitious. And most importantly, you have to be structured. You have to have a structured life. You can't just wake up whenever you feel like it, go to sleep whenever you feel like it, and hope for the best to happen in between. You have to have a structured life. When to work, when to eat, when to sleep, when to be with family, when to learn. This is much harder to do than to, than to say, but nonetheless, in order for you to achieve real purpose and real success, you have to have a structured life. Another thing is, we're almost done, right direction. You know for sure, once you're in Torah, you're really in it. Not like you just started and you're not really like, once you're in the Torah world, you know for sure, you're going the right direction. You have a certain level of certainty that this is it. Definitely going the right. You know how like you got lost on the road? You don't have a GPS. You got lost on the road, but finally you got to a certain place where you know for sure this is the right place. That's it. You feel that all the time. Next thing is being good. It feels good to be good. No one could ever say, ah, you know what, that guy, what a jerk. Can't. If you're really fulfilling to what? If you're just one of those posers, if you're one of those fakers that has a long beard and is cheating everybody because of it, then obviously you're, none of this stuff applies to you. You should get out of my room. Don't learn with me. I don't like you. But if you want to actually fulfill your purpose and you want to be good, then you'll try to be good. And eventually you'll get to be good. And being good feels good. At least trying to be good feels good. Spiritual enlightenment. Impossible for me to explain but it's a certain sense of, I've never done drugs in my life, but whoever, as, whoever did, whoever understands what it means, it's a certain high. It's a certain high where you just feel something amazing all the time, or at least sometimes. And there's different levels of it. There's a level that you feel on a day-to-day -day basis, just because you're connected to the Creator. And then there's something you can potentially get if you learn a lot of Torah. Like a lot, not like two hours, a lot, for a while. Not even just one, like a lot. And there's a certain feeling that you can get that, how do I explain this? Um, it connects the spiritual with the physical. It's impossible for me to explain, but it's something out of this world. It's a, it's a feeling that no high in the world could even come close to. It's... I guess, for lack of a better word, it's an out-of-body experience. It's unbelievable. You'll have a chance of getting there. Uh, you'll be motivated and you'll be motivating. Anyone that's connected to Hashem is always motivated to do more, but he also wants to motivate others. Wants to do others because when good... The definition of good is something that wants to create good. I know if you're good, if you're doing good things. If you're doing good things, that means you're creating good. The reason why, one of the reasons why Hashem created the world is because He's good. In order to be good, you have to create more good. If we want to be good, we have to show that we're good. You can't just be good and you're locked in a uh, cave by yourself and while everybody else outside of the cave is starving and you have all the food. If you have the goods, you want to share them because you're good. So... You'll be motivated and you'll be motivating. You'll also be very careful because you're not going to want to ruin it. This is one part of Yad Shemayim. 
You'll be careful because you're not going to want to ruin it. You're not, want to, you're not going to want to skip study sessions. You're not going to want to curse. You're not going to want to scream. You're not going to want to get mad. You're not going to want to do certain things that make you lose all of it in an instant. That amazing feeling we talked about for the last 20 minutes, you lose it in an instant with one yell. One curse. You'll be concerned, which means you'll always be monitoring which direction you're going to. And most importantly, you'll have the big picture. And that big picture is the ultimate purpose. And that ultimate purpose depends on two things that everyone talks about and has millions of lectures about. But no one truly understands what it means unless they know at least some parts of the reward in this world, which is everything I just said. And those two things are for, to, to get the big picture... To be the big winner, you have to have two things. Emunah and bitachon. Emunah means there's someone running the world and they got it under control. Don't worry about it. Bitachon means they also got you in mind and they'll take care of you. So even a monkey can be convinced that there's a creator. So having emunah is not exactly that big of an attainment. Bitachon is something different, something that requires a little bit of effort. So Hashem told Rabbi Hanina ben Akasha at the end of every Mishnah, and he gave him the obvious the Siat Ishmael to, to make this ma'amal, to say this saying, which is that the Holy One blessed, he, blessed is he wished to confer merit upon Israel, therefore he gave them Torah and mitzvot in abundance. As it is said, Hashem desired for the sake of, its, of, uh, of Israel's righteousness that the Torah be made great and glorious. In so many words, Hashem gave you an opportunity to attain this entire list that I just told you just in this world. And this is not even a down payment of the real reward. The way you do it is following what Rabbi Hanina is telling us at the end of every Mishnah, which is fulfill these this abundance of Torah and mitzvot, collect those diamonds as often as you possibly can and everything's possible. Any questions? Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.